G'day folks, welcome along as it's time for our little chat for the week. It's uh, great to be with you again and um, just before I get into that, let's, um, I'll just tell you that on Monday we're going to be having a leaders meeting to discuss restarting church, so I uh, pray that you can be in prayer for that and we'll come to some kind of conclusion pretty soon, so that'll be great. But uh, as we get into this uh, incredible psalm today, Psalm 27, let's open with prayer. Father God, we are uh, thankful again to have this medium to communicate with each other and uh, just, Lord, as we look into your word today, we pray that what David's written down for us can be helpful and to be an encouragement and to be a challenge for us as well, Lord. We just we want to be more like you, Lord, so I pray that you work that today through what I have to say. So thank you for this chance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so... I went to Woolies the other day, I thought I'll start with this little anecdote, and I was just, it's not really an anecdote, I was just going to say I, I didn't see there was much of a issue with the flour and the toilet paper this time, so it's really nice to see those things are coming back. In fact, I think when I went to Coles, it was a massive, big, great big wall of toilet paper, so very encouraging to see, and perhaps a sign that we're back on the road to some kind of normality after this, this well, not after the virus is still there, but, um, you know, it's it's on the way out, God willing. But as we all know, a little while ago there was a heap of panic buying going on and uh, now I suspect that were, a lot of that was really just unscrupulous people seeking to try and, and make a buck by you know, exploiting the system and, and people's fears. But still it did tend to bring out the worst in some people, didn't it? And it was exacerbated by the fear that many had and still have that their life and lifestyle might not be as secure as they thought. So yes, this was all evidence that fear had been driving a lot of people, or has been driving a lot of people uh, during this time and in a lot of different areas of life. So I want to talk about fear for a bit. Um, for this reason, and also since David in Psalm 27 that we're looking at today, um, He's put that part of human experience sort of front and centre in this psalm. So let's try and understand it a bit better before we go and look at what he's got to say, shall we? So, um, so the, what, what is fear, really? How do you def define it? Well, here's a helpful def definition I found. It was this one. Fear is a normal, natural flight response to a danger in our surroundings. Now... I like that one because I think it covers much of the broad spectrum of kind of what fear means, you know, the, the usage of the word in general. Okay? From the fear of God. So, yet when you're before the one and truly holy, powerful God, the right reaction should be that natural feeling to want to hide and protect yourself and say, go away, Lord, you know, and then that's something many in the Bible experienced and we can look in many places for that. So it's, just, it's an acknowledgement of the vast disparity in the power and holiness between people like you and I and him. So that's one kind. And there's, there's the kind of fear that you get if you happen to be standing in the middle of the road and then a truck is bearing down on you. And yep, our natural reaction is to jump out of the way. And again, so the fear is that natural self-preservation instinct, right? And there's no denying that's a good thing, of course. It's programmed into us by our God at creation. Now, we also see another angle on that self-preservation instinct when someone perhaps has a fear of heights. Just standing on a high place can bring some people to a kind of fear that's almost irrational, you know. It's pretty hard to reason with. But interestingly for others, you know, sometimes to stand near the the edge of a tall building or whatever, you know, it's, it's nothing to them. It's just do it and look over the edge and everything's fine. And it's this difference that I want to explore for a minute. You know, what is it that one person in a situation feels so incredibly terrified about that another person in exactly the same situation doesn't worry about in the slightest? Well, it's all about perception of danger. So for one person, they picture themselves falling off that building to their death. Should the slightest breeze come or they just get slightly dizzy or something, you know, whatever it is, it's, that's, they picture themselves doing that. 
but the other person in the same position exactly says, hey, this platform's solid, this rail's good, I'm not planning on jumping off, so everything's fine, so what's the big deal? You know? So they're, they're the two ways of looking at it, the perception, how you perceive the situation. And in some ways I see both kinds of response around us to the events we're immersed in at the moment with COVID-19. There are some who take every possible precaution and live in constant stress that they might die of the virus, while others are completely the opposite, you know, to the point of being obnoxious because they insult and disrespect others for not being as cavalier as they are. And you've probably seen both kinds. Um, and, and yeah, for the record, I think both extremes should be avoided. But see, so, so the battle for the best ground to stand on is really one between fear and prudence. Now, I don't talk about prudence very often. It's a kind of an old-fashioned word. So um, you know, if we have a definition for fear, we probably need a definition for prudence since it's not commonly used. But it's the word I'm going to use today because I think it's the best word. So prudence, what is it? Prudence is the ability to govern and discipline oneself by the use of reason. So what we probably all agree on is that we should be prudent, not fearful. Okay, So we should be more towards the prudence area than the fearful area. But the placement of that line, now where you fit on that position there, is, is very much in the eye of the beholder. But to be honest, when we look all around us, I think we have too many people who think they're being prudent when really they're being fearful. For example, someone who bought more than their fair share of toilet paper, we all know them. Actually, no, I didn't see any, but I didn't go down the shops very often. But, you know, say you, say you went and you bought as much toilet paper as you could fit in your trolley. It's, it's, that person may want to argue that they're just being prudent, you know, because I've got to get it while I can. But others would see that as fear and selfishness and greed too, I'm sure, if we're being honest. But we need to ask ourselves, where is that line, prudence and fear? And you know, we can justify things in our own minds, but where is it more um, objectively, I suppose, is what we're looking for. Well, to figure that out, let's compare these, the definitions there of uh, fear and prudence. First, how are they similar? Well, they are similar in that they are both responses to some kind of threat or danger. Something bad is coming. Or, or is here, you know, so, and then you have the choice of two things, to be fearful or be prudent. Now, I guess there's some possibility of a combination of those two things, but uh, we'll just keep it simple now for clarity, keep them separate. And how are they different then? So if they're similar in that they're a response, but how are they different? Well, as I see it, it's that fear is the natural instinctive response, that is, it's of this material world, but prudence is a reasoned response, so one of intentional and measured control of oneself. Um, it, it assesses the possibilities and the probabilities and the degrees of actual danger and makes decisions according to that. So it takes a bit of time to work it out. So notice the key word there in the definition, reason. Right? So reason is what is being applied. Fear is not from reason. It's instinctive, like I said. It's, but prudence is from applied wisdom, so understanding knowledge and applying that and applying the wisdom. Therefore, in a spiritual context, we should always be considering, um, well, that's, yeah, we should be have our spiritual uh, uh, self switched on all the time. So with that, it should be one with a constant reference to God and his word, of course. Okay, that's our spiritual source of, of um, information and, and God's guidance. And, and we've got to seek for God, obviously, because he is the definition of reason, if you think about it. So God is the source of all reasonableness and order. So prudence would be to overcome that instinctive fear and take control, to look firstly at the biblical truth about whatever the matter is, and secondly, the facts of the matter from a worldly aspect as well. So you know, the spiritual aspect and the worldly aspect. Now, you might say, yes, but how does that work if a truck's about to hit you? Well, as I said, it's our natural God-given instinct for self-preservation, the whole truck hitting you thing and you jump out of the way. That's, that's a good thing, of course. No one argues with that. The issue at play here is what to do with threats like COVID-19 and the 
huge range of challenges it brings with it. Have, have you noticed how it just it's in every part of life, isn't it? And you have to you have to really think through all the, the permutations of your actions. So what I'm saying is to be informed about who God is through his written word first and also from personal experience of a life spent with him so that's you know, through his word and through experience we get to know God obviously the written word is inerrant and at the same time as we understand God we are informed of the facts that we see around us of life we need to make sure we are informed now the facts on the first case so you know, on God that's relatively straightforward you know, read the Bible Okay. But the facts on the second, the truth about the pandemic, are a whole lot harder to be certain of because there are a whole lot of people looking to exploit this situation for their own ends and it can leave us pretty confused. Because you know, who do you believe? That's why we need to begin with the Word of God as the cornerstone of our thinking. That's what I tried to illustrate in the picture down there. And uh, everything in the world will then ev eventually fit in somewhere in relation to that fundamental truth. So we're going to do that now, of course. We're going to get into Psalm 27. And hopefully as we go through, he'll shed some light for us on some of those questions, um, that, you know, whether we're being prudent or fearful in life. So that's hopefully what we're Psalm 27 will lead us a bit of a instructive journey on there. So Psalm 27, it's another Psalm of David and the Septuagint translation of the Bible, that's the old Greek translation before Jesus. Um, it tells us that this was from the time before David was crowned as king. So if that's true, it's most likely reflecting some more troubles with King Saul coming to chase him down again. And this first part was written as a hymn leading the congregation in thinking rightly about God and about life. If you think about that's this part of it is. And then a little later he switches into a prayer kind of mode where he speaks directly to God. But for the first six verses he's more in preacher mode. So we read in verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now David shows us here how prudence works to overpower fear. Because he was certainly under threat. And if, if, I, if it was, as I suggested before, that, that this is written in the context of Paul's, sorry, Saul. Um, yeah, Paul's a whole different guy. The Old Testament Saul, the king. His um, repeated attempts on David's life. So if that was a situation, the threat was not just a perception. It was very real, wasn't it? So it's natural for David to run away from Saul. And he does. And he hides out in the wilderness with his gang of fighters, you know, that was around this time. But look how he starts um, in, in his working through the fear. He says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. So his first thought is God, right? Especially the facts that he is light and salvation. And if you look at that, those two things, you can see that this is comprehensive, and I'll show you why. Because light is for the path immediately before you, right? You know, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's God's word, God is himself as well. So the light is for right now. It shows the way by letting you see the truth about where you are, what surrounds you as well, to some extent, and, and the opportunities and threats that exist in the immediate, in the immediate vicinity. That's what a little light um, in, in where you stand at the point. That's what it does for you. So God is his light in the present to see the way. But he's also David's salvation. And he's in the thick of the trouble right now, but he knows that salvation is coming. Both the temporal salvation, that's the deliverance from his difficulties, his immediate difficulties, because he knows God has promised he will take the throne at some point, so he has to rescue him. That's his faith in God. God's promised it. Well, it's going to happen. Your problem, Lord, kind of thing. So that's the, the temporal around him life stuff, but it's, there's... Also, the ultimate spiritual salvation, which sort of is you know, in parallel with this. He knows he will see God in person one day and will spend eternity with him. And as we saw last week, that's the driving truth in his life. That's where his focus always is. That future glory is always in his mind. So when we put these together, 
the light of God and the salvation of God. We see that God is everything he needs for both now and for the future. As far forward as you could possibly think about. So he's the light for the path today and he's the means of salvation whenever it comes down the road, the, the salvation from the situation. And in the picture I've chosen here, so um, that, that destination is more light than the path. I realise that. But still, they're, they're both light for us, aren't they? The light from God lights our path, so you know, don't let that send you off track. So anyway, God is both the way and the destination in David's life. That's where I'm getting at there. So, so how is this, that he's just said, the antidote for fear in his life? So, and, and can we apply it in our lives too, is the question, of course. Well, if the way and the destination are from God, then we can be sure that whatever is involved in achieving those things will be taken into consideration by him already. Because God is all-powerful. Nothing catches him by surprise. So whatever comes across our path, God has foreseen. In fact, he's ordained it, if we're honest. And each thing along the journey has a purpose. And sure, along the way, the natural reaction of fear will come at various times. So what does David tell us about how to be prudent in those times? Well, we take refuge in the Lord, the stronghold of our lives, as he says there. Meaning, of course, that he's our protection from anything that will truly damage our souls. Of course, we should choose to, or should we choose to leave that fortress and go and try and do it alone. Uh, we will sort of put ourselves in a vulnerable position unnecessarily, you know. But even then, God in his grace works that into his ultimate plan too. So it's not, not a good idea to do, obviously, to step out from God's protection, but he will deal with it in his way and, and turn it to good somehow. But that doesn't mean we should do it, obviously. Stay under God's protection. But yes, that's why David can face life in a fearless way, by that faith in God. So as we go to verse 2, that faith means he can see the future of his enemies as well, to some degree. Verse 2, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Again, remember that David has been promised that he will be king in his lifetime, so that's the part of the reason he can be confident in the, in the downfall of his enemies, to some degree at least. Now, we haven't been promised such a specific thing in our lives, so we can't always say that those who oppose us in the world will fall in this life. But we can say that we know we will be vindicated in the end. So in the meantime, we need to pray for those who attack us, as Jesus instructed us, and for those who um, were perhaps caught the kids' video last week, one of the kids' videos, uh, Sean W. Smith, he quoted this verse that Jesus said, Luke 6, verses 27 and 28, about loving our enemies. He says, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, Pray for those who abuse you. Because we don't know whether you know, their attack on us is really just them fighting back against God's Spirit who's convicting them and, you know, and then they, they may be just about to repent. That's why they're getting so antsy. So it's always that possibility. So we need to be hopeful of that when we're being hassled by them, which is definitely easier said than done, of course. But we still, you know, that's what we should be striving for, is to pray and think about what may be going on in their hearts. But whatever happens with them, we know that God sorts out the mess in the end and if we're faithful to him through it all, we'll be vindicated when we have to give our account to him. And it's, it's that kind of faithfulness that gives us the eyes to see beyond our tricky circumstances. Verse 3, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. And David should know you know, he's the one who faced Goliath as a youth and defeated him. And this verse, for me, it also brought to mind the, the time Elisha had to ask God to open the eyes of his assistant. He was you know, freaking out about being surrounded by the enemy, physical armies actually right there. And um, understandably, he was like, well, what are we going to do? And when, so, so Elisha said, you know, Lord, open his eyes. So God did, and he saw the heavenly spiritual armies and that the numbers of them was far more, and they outweighed the material ones by many times. 
And, and that's really the point. And it's hard for us to, to grasp that, but that, that is the point. They are real, these spiritual armies, and they're, you know, they're right there with us. And as was well said by John Knox, one with God is a majority. So one, just you, me, whoever, with God is a majority. Or perhaps you prefer Romans 8.31, well-known one, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is there, what's, what's the rest going to matter? It's not going to add up to anything. So Now that's just not just a good, pious thing to say. It's the spiritual reality. So like Elisha's servant, we need to have our eyes open to that reality by God and by faith. So let's keep seeking God for that kind of insight because it's the fundamental truth, not just wishful thinking. Okay, We don't just imagine that there's lots of angels around you. There may, may well be, but there's, the armies are somewhere and they're looking after you. I'm not sure that came out the way exactly how I expected it, but you get the point. So now we move on from that section of the psalm about the reason for fearlessness into a section in which David describes a life with God at the centre. When you have him as your singular focus and you're not distracted from him. So that's the next bit. Verse 4 begins that. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So it's one thing he mentions there. One thing. So if everything in life is taken away from him and he has the option of one thing to have, what is it? Well, it's being with God, he says. And in the Old Testament context, that's a reference to the house of the Lord. And in David's day, that was the pre-Solomon temple. Um, and he's, So he's talking about the tent they called the tabernacle. And if this psalm was indeed an early one, the tabernacle was being moved all over the place. But the point was the physical location was secondary. The presence of God was the main issue. And God had chosen to dwell where the ark and the tabernacle were. So to be focused on God in person was to be focused on the tabernacle, the, the house of God, which in verses 4 to 6 is variously called, so yeah, in verse 4, there, I think, the house of the Lord. That's what it's called there. And it's yeah, the first part of the verse there. Uh, it's also called his temple, which is a bit of, more of a look to the future for David. And coming up we'll see he calls it his shelter. That's verse 5, although that can also have general connotations about you know, the protecting presence of God in all places, being his shelter, but because it fits in here, it's another way of describing the tabernacle as well, his shelter. And in verses 5 and 6, he describes it as his tent as well, so God's tent. So this was where David sought God and his face and his counsel. So for us today, we do the same thing through the indwelling Spirit of God. Not that we look inside ourselves for answers, that's a pagan idea, don't do that, but we realise that God's Spirit is right there with ours if we are regenerated and he will guide us into truth as our counsellor. And or you know, my more modern word might be like a coach sort of thing, you know. Um, a coach as to what his written word says and to, as to how that lights the way forward in our lives. That's kind of a similar concept to that which Dave is trying to convey here, I, I, th I believe, the idea of um, being guided by God like that. And so you can sort of see oozing out of this verse in, in this psalm in general, really, is, is that, that passion for God. Can you see that there? It's, it's his personal awe at the beauty and joy of knowing God. And so how often do you see that kind of attitude in people today? I'll let you think about the answer for yourself. Perhaps you mix with lots of people like that. I don't know, but um, it, I, well, I will say I think they're reasonably hard to find someone with that kind of passion. But the point is, that's the kind of attitude we need to be having towards God too, not just them, not just other people. But it doesn't come from just you know, trying harder to feel that way. He comes about with a firm commitment that says, Lord, I'm going to make it my priority to spend time with you. And like we saw last week, Others Who Love You Too is a, is a good place to hang out as well. 
but I'm just talking about that commitment to really get into God's Word by myself. And, and even if doing that sometimes seems a bit tedious or boring or things are a bit dry, I'm not going to give up. That's the attitude. I'm not going to give up. Even if I just read one verse and just take it with me to think on, on the day. So if that becomes true of you, I'm convinced you'll be blessed by, you know, by an ever-deepening love for God that is, and, a, and a richer relationship with Him. That's, that's where it comes from, just baby steps. you know. But we need to develop and maintain that focus like David does. So in verse 5, For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. So here is more of David's confidence in God to be his shelter, you know, his rescuer when trouble comes. And of course the obvious meaning of this is you know, for the worldly persecution that he's experiencing at that time. So he's figuratively, uh, figuratively referring to shelters and tents and rocks as pictures of you know, protection and security of God. Uh, but I think the Holy Spirit guided David to put it in language that helps us look further forward as well. Because you can see that this applies just as well to David's future rescue beyond this life. Can, I hope you can see that there. Um, so you know, when, when he dies and is with God, David does, he, he will have his ultimate shelter and concealment from the troubles of this world and will be high on a rock. Keeping in mind the image of the rock in the Bible is very often applicable to as a, as a symbol of Jesus. Okay, as a rock. So yes, even David can say he will stand on the rock of God the Son by seeing him face to face in heaven one day. And what's true for him here is also true for us as well, which is a pretty cool thing. But for us in our context, some suggest it even has hints of the rapture in there too, with the idea of being hidden away from the time of trouble, or tribulation if you like, by being lifted up high on a rock. Now, I hasten to add, this view is not without its critics, of course. Many people don't even believe there's a rapture, but I think that's pretty clear in the Bible. But um, whatever you think about it, I think the, there's evidence there that there's, a, there's an elegant multiple layers in, in this little, this in God's Word generally, but especially here. And that's pretty typical of how, how God invests truth in the, in the depth of His Word. So you know, there's... David's local layer, there's the layer of David's you know, longer term uh, eschatological end of, end of days thing. And then the, it also applies to general people, um, even perhaps there's a pattern of the rapture as well. So there's all those layers in his word. So that's why it's such a rich place to dwell in your heart and your mind on. And that idea, that pattern still fits kind of as we go into verse 6. When the worldly ones are down, while the believer's head is lifted up. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Now back in the original context, obviously this is referring to David being vindicated, just as he asked for in verse 1 of the previous psalm. So he's not ashamed, but rather he can confidently and joyously praise God in the face of his opponents. And don't miss the use of music there. Music is distinctively powerful uh, it's an, as an aspect of the worship of God. It's not the only thing in worship of God, as we often seem to put it that way, but it's, it's certainly a powerful aspect of the broad thing that is the worship of God. And sometimes I do wonder why we have developed the tradition of only ever really singing when we meet on a Sunday, you know, and not really at other times. Because it's always struck me that Matthew, when giving his account of the Last Supper, says that Jesus and his disciples sang after their dinner, you know, just as they were about to head out. So I'll show you, Matthew 26, verse 30. And when they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So now that was just a matter of hours before Jesus was going to be crucified. You might not think he'd be keen about singing, but uh, that's what they did. So yeah, they just, in the presence of a few friends, they sang praise to God. So... Um, now yeah, I'm not going to say we're going to start doing that kind of thing in our church business, business meetings necessarily or whatever but I do just want to let us think about the value of music generally as a vehicle for not just enjoyment but also for learning about God 
because you know, there's lyrics, especially the lyrics are from scripture, and for general encouragement and lifting your spirit. You know, music has a way of doing that. And now I realise some of you are not musical at all, and I get that, but still I'll leave that with you to ponder about. You know, can you put music in other more things in life? I'm someone who just puts it on around the house doing stuff because I love music, but. Yeah, let's let's see how we how much we can invest music in our rest of our lives. Okay, so uh, you can see we're running low on time. So let's go into the next section, Psalm of Psalm 27, which is called "Face to Face with You, Lord." And it's well, that's what I call it anyway. And it's a part of the psalm that becomes a prayer directly to God. And you'll notice David starts using "you" and "your" as you know, as pronouns as he speaks to God. And he starts with a request for an answer. So verse seven. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Now remember, this is not to say that God has been ignoring him. He's, and he's trying to get God to pay attention. Now, hey, over here, you know. Uh, this is just normal father-son dialogue. If you're in trouble and you want your dad to come and help out, your anguish is more to do with the difficulty of the situation, not doubt in his ability or desire to help you, right? Because you know, it's your dad. Okay, now the next verse is a tricky one. There are various translations because the original Hebrew is hard to decipher. So here's what I, I'll just show you the regular translation that we use in the ESV, um, what that says for verse 8. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. But in that, the translators there of the ESV, they kind of massaged a few pronouns to try and make sense of it there. By massage, I mean completely changed <laughs> But So yeah, here's, here's a more literal translation of verse 8 that I've tried to do for what it's worth. My heart said to you, seek my face. It's your face, O Lord, that I will seek. So rather than God saying, seek my face, the original Hebrew has David's heart saying it. That's kind of the, the point there. So I think we should go with that, yeah, since it's more in line with the original text, which I guess then means that David's heart is calling to God to come to him to seek his face, which is perfectly consistent with what he just said in verse 7 you know, and he says this because he is seeking the Lord's face so to me it makes good sense David is asking God to face him because he's seeking to face God and he wants that face to face personal relationship with God and to further that verse 9 continues with a similar thought to the first half of verse 8 hide not your face from me turn not your servant away in anger O you who have been my help Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. So this whole prayer that we've been reading the last few verses is one of a man longing to relate to God in a deeper way. Not that God has let him down or anything or you know, in the past or even currently, but just that what he's tasted in God so far has only served to you know, develop his appetite for more of God. You know, So that's how it should be. He realizes he doesn't deserve it. So he asks that any sin that may have incited God's anger be forgiven, which is also inherent in the idea of being his salvation, of course, and his salvation from his sin. And even those closest to him on earth can't compete without grace. So you see that in verse 10. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Now that gives the impression, kind of, here that his parents, it sounds like he's rejected him, you know. Yes, parents have gone. But scholars doubt that this is really what's what's in view here because it's I note here that um, a relevant passage is 1 Samuel 22, verses 3 to 4, and we read there that David sent his parents, and remember who his dad was, his name was um, Jesse, so that's someone you may have heard of. But yeah, so his parents, he sent them off into protective custody in Moab for a while while he was under threat. So it's obviously pretty serious. So perhaps this psalm was written during that time or around that time when his parents were absent, in which case the word translated forsaken there might have the other have a, one of its other meanings, which is just left. You know? So they're just currently absent from his direct contact at this time. But in spite of that, God is his refuge anyway. So whether they're there or they're not, God is his ultimate refuge. And that can be a comfort for everyone, especially those of us who are, who are without one or both of our parents for whatever reason. And while missing them is certainly hard, or even if we've never really known our mum and dad, 
or perhaps they weren't all they should be, and that's fairly common. Just be aware God is willing to take you in. If there's any, well, even if you do have per- perfect parents, God's still willing to take you in because he's the eternal father. So he's able to be that father that you need, that you and I need. He's the perfect father. And so like David here, we can place our complete trust in him. Now we get to the last part of this prayer and the focus now shifts slightly to how that trust in God helps to keep him on track. So verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Now this may link back to the last verse of Psalm 26 where he says that he stands on level ground. And we noted then that the idea is that the road is firm, not that it's easy, okay, but level ground is not, oh, this is a piece of cake, no, it's just that it's firm and it's solid. So as um, American commentator David Guzik notes, in asking for a smooth path, he wasn't asking for an easy life, but for a stable and secure place to stand against the storms of this life. And don't we all need the same thing? We need a solid place to build our lives. And you only get it in Jesus Christ. Every other foundation will ultimately get washed away in the wind and rain of life's storms. Your parents are great, and if they're there your whole life, it's great, but it's, it's Jesus Christ who's going to take us beyond that, even. So it's like in the parable that Jesus told of the two houses, one built on sand and one built on the rock. And again, Jesus himself is the rock. But anything else you might be tempted to bet your life upon, so whether it's money, too many people trust money, status, getting status is it, work, pour yourself into work, or even family. You know, Whatever you place your hope and identity on above Jesus is unworthy of your, and, and of my as well, obviously, um, ultimate trust. Is it unworthy of our ultimate trust? Of course I'm not saying to be harshly sceptical of everyone and everything. That's, that's a bad attitude to have. But what I am saying, is, and I believe David here is saying too, is simply that in the final analysis we need to remember that everything other than Jesus is fallible. So just keep that in mind. Only God can give you that eternal foundation to face your enemies. Verse 12, Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. So we get a glimpse here into the nature of David's persecution. And we see in the picture there one of the times Saul tried to spear David. So you know, that was a literal violent act against him. But he was also copying it with words because there, was, there were um, people who were accusing him falsely. So David is therefore asking that their accusations come to nothing since they're unfounded for one, but also because their motives and methods are evil coming from a heart of violence, wanting to hurt him. And it's from this mess of earthly trouble that David lifts his eyes to what I would argue is his eternal hope. Verse 13. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I say this is his eternal hope because what other place can be considered the land of the living more than heaven? Eh? This world is in many ways a land of death certainly since the fall. So I think David is lifting his eyes above the storms of life to a higher fixed point of light, the light of God's eternal throne. So David is again expressing that longing to see the goodness of God in person. That is his guiding light. It's the goal of his travels on earth. So remember we saw here, he said God was both uh, light for the way now and salvation for the end in the future as well. This is what's you know, keeping him on track in his life now. Helping, helping him to be prudent rather than fearful. So can you and I st- say the same? Can we, can we claim the same thing that David did there? Are the storms around us now distracting us from God or making us seek him more? Are they making you bitter or better? That's, that's one thing, way you can describe it. So bad things, they, they help sort out the men from the boys, if you like, if I can say that. And I think the example of David here is one to keep in mind in this regard. Yeah? The bad things in life made him turn to God. Okay, so as we close now, David turns back to the congregation with his final encouragement in light of all that he's been saying in this psalm. And if he does that, I'll do it too. 
Um, it's, it's an encouragement that, yes, it may seem like things are going on a bit long, but God is saying to trust him. He's still in control, so hang in there. It's not just passively waiting either. You know, it's, it's not just sitting around doing nothing, just sitting on the hillside waiting. But it's courageously getting about the business of the kingdom while we still can. As the title of this message says, that's the fearless way home. So it's kind of like you have one road on one eye on the road and one eye to the skies and, and we keep the balance. Knowing that one day we will see him face to face and be with him forever. So here's the closing verse and, and our closing thought too, verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So he repeats it. Wait for the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Lord, help us to wait for you, Lord, not in the way of doing nothing and just waiting for you to come and take us out of here or anything, Lord, but you've given us tasks. You've given us your spirit to show us those tasks and light the way. And Lord, we thank you that you've done that for us. You've given us that coach, that help. So Lord, help us to listen to you. Thank you for what David has been teaching us today. And we pray this um, does change our lives and it helps us to honour you more. So we thank you so much for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah.